Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Mobile Trends, What to Expect in 2023. I'm your host, Evelyn Mitchell, analyst at Insider Intelligence, based in Virginia, and I'm joined by my colleague, Principal Analyst Yuri Wormser, who's in New Jersey. Hi, Yuri. Great to have you here. Hey, Evelyn. Great to be here. Before we get to the main presentation, I'd like to thank T-Mobile Advertising Solutions for making today's webinar possible. And welcome Jess Zhu, Head of Advertising Products and Development at T-Mobile Advertising Solutions. Jess is joining us from Seattle. Hi, Jess. Hi. Thanks for having me. We are happy to have you. A few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share with you today, but there's no need to take notes if you would prefer not to. Uh, we will email you a link to the slides and the full recording of today's presentation. But we do want you to participate. Just use the chat window to the right of the video feed to submit any questions you might have at any time during the presentation. And then we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A at the end of our session. So with that, Yori, let's get started. What's on the agenda today? Thanks, Evelyn, and thanks to all of you for joining us on today's webinar on mobile trends and what we at Insider Intelligence expect for 2023. This is always one of my favorite webinars to do just because I've been covering mobile for a long, long time, uh, and it's interesting to see what's coming up. So with that in mind, I'll answer your question, Evelyn, and look at the agenda. So we're going to start with just a few slides of context before going into our five trends. Um, and to be clear, these are not comprehensive trends or other mobile trends as well. But we're gonna focus on these five here. And the first one is that mobile AR gets anchored and by anchored, we mean uh, anchored to locations. Um, a second trend we expect to see is mobile measurement enters the eye of the privacy storm. And for those of you who aren't Hamilton buffs or meteorologists, the eye of the storm, privacy storm is a bit of calm between uh, iOS 14.5 and what's coming down the line. Third, we're going to look at Matter um, and how that will accelerate the smartphone's role as remote control. Matter is the interoperable standard that's coming online right around now. Uh, fourth, we're going to look at uh, low Earth orbit satellite networks uh, and how they will become a much bigger part of remote mobile service uh, starting really in 2023, starting actually the last few weeks. Um, and fifth, we'll look at Apple's aggressive push into advertising, which we expect will continue. And finally, we'll just wrap up with a few key takeaways. So let's start with the context. Um, and the context really is that mobile continues to be a huge part of our lives and a growing part. Um, in 2022, so this year, we're spending over three hours and 19 minutes per day on our smartphones. Uh, this is in the US and some countries like Malaysia and, and, and Far East. The numbers are even higher. And the numbers are still increasing, even after the pandemic, when we all spent a lot of time on our phones. So next year, we expect the number to add, be seven minutes longer and, and reach three hours and 26 minutes. So just really a, a huge part of our lives are, are, is happening on smartphones. And it's not just time we're spending. We're spending a lot of money as well. Um, M-commerce is growing, continues to grow at a rapid rate. Again, going back to the pandemic, big spike there. But even with that higher base, um, we're still seeing growth. Uh, we saw nearly 10% growth in 2022, which is actually very low for M-commerce, but it's gonna bounce back to 13.2%, which with the numbers we're talking about is an additional $55 billion up to almost five, $500 billion, almost half a trillion dollars in M-commerce sales just in the US. So just uh, huge numbers, uh, huge dollar amounts uh, coming through mobile. So let's get into our first trend, which is uh, that mobile AR gets anchored. So what, what is anchored AR? Um, probably the best way to explain it is it's, anch it's AR to, as, a, as a virtual experience that an that's anchored to a specific location. And the best example is Pokemon Go or uh, and the Pokestop there. This image is just a sponsored Pokestop from uh, McDonald's. Um, but that's kind of an old example. I think Pokemon Go came out in 2015. It's probably the one most of us can easily, most easily comprehend or grasp since it's been around and probably we had kids or were kids who were playing around with it when it came out. Um, but there are a lot more sophisticated versions of it now. Um, uh, you, the companies that are really diving deep into mobile AR or anchored AR 
are ones that have a, a spatial map of the world, a 3D map of the world. So you have uh, obviously uh, Apple and Google, um, you have Niantic who designed Pokemon Go, and you have Snap and, and a few other companies as well. But I want to focus on, on, on these four here because I think they, they're really leading in anchored AR. So Snap uh, recently came out with um, custom land markers, which are just mobile AR experiences that developers can create based on specific landmarks. This is the Eiffel Tower. Um, these are all GIFs. Um, the Paris kind of gives bubble balloons around it, um, uh, as bubble balloons around the Eiffel Tower is one example. Apple has its developer kit, uh, our kit, AR kit. Um, th this image here is just from Apple Maps and how there's an overlay of, of street directions, very similar to Live View, which is a uh, Google Maps version of uh, AR maps. Um, but Google has recently opened up our core to, um, to, for its custom experiences. Um, so it has an API for, for the, using that developer platform, uh, that, that there's developer tools for anchors. Um, you can see this dragon hopping out of a, out of a building. And lastly, there's Niantic with Lightship that, uh, came up, uh, with Pokemon Go. It opened up its platform for developers. Uh, and you're seeing a superhuman or monster arm popping out of a building. That's the type of thing you can do with these platforms. So really cool stuff. Um, still kind of early on, but I think we're going to see a lot more of that in 2023. Um, one other technology I want to highlight are QR codes because they're kind of a, a low-tech version. or not really a low-tech, but, but a more easy-to-use version of uh, launching an, a an AR experience from a specific location. And you're seeing a lot of out of home advertising, either on billboards, on, on digital screens that have QR codes and are launching an AR experience or a mobile commerce experience. Um, so just a lot of ways to enhance the mobile experience and turn the mobile screen into a more a richer experience, either with multiple screens in the case of digital out of home or in terms of, a, of an AR experience with billboards or direct to a product page. Um, you're also seeing AR in general get more used over uh, 97 billion, a million people will use AR in the US uh, in 2023. And, and just as a, something I forgot to mention, over 94 million are going to use QR codes. So a lot of people are using both AR and QR codes on their smartphones. Um, about two thirds of those, I mean, or even more than two thirds of the people using AR are experience, experience it, experiencing it through social media, things like uh, Snapchat uh, lenses or Instagram or TikTok. Um, so just a really a lot of use, a lot of really, really um, vivid use cases coming out, out. And that's this is happening at the same time as one more contextual set of numbers I want to point out. And that's just that US mobile ad spending continues to rise. Um, we expect it to rise about $24 billion in the US in 2023 to $194 billion. Um, this is uh, accounting for any type of economic slowdown that we've had so far and that we expect. So we're, we're expecting the mobile advertising industry to weather that and combined with uh, mobile AR uh, QR codes and some of these other technologies in terms of anchoring, we expect to see a, a pretty big rise in mobile AR advertising, which is in fact one of the predictions we have based on this trend. Um, uh, going kind of... Uh, out of order, but counterclockwise here or clockwise, mobile AR advertising will grow despite the recession fears. Um, uh, Art Artillery Intelligence is one of those companies that projects mobile AR advertising revenue. They projected to rise from 4.1 billion in 2022 to nearly 10 billion in 2026. So a big jump, uh, more than double in four years. Um, with ambitious AR devices on the horizon, major platforms will double down on anchored AR tools. The idea here is that if you look at all the big tech companies, even with the recessionary fears that some of them are having and the uh, layoffs within the tech industry, you're still seeing Meta, Google, Apple, Snap, all of them commit, uh, remain committed to developing AR tools and mixed reality to, uh, devices, things like smart glasses or headsets like the uh, Quest Pro that just came out a few weeks ago from Meta. Um, Apple is rumored to have an XR headset on the way, um, Snap, and Google both have uh, smart glasses, lots of innovation there. So they're going to keep on investing in AR. 
QR launch they are will rejuvenate out of home advertising. It's already happening. Um, we predict predict out of home advertising will increase by 6.0% in the US in 2023. And part of that is going to be because of the richer experiencing experiences that QR codes are going to, going to allow. So that's the, the first trend that I wanted to mention. The second trend is mobile measurement enters the eye of the privacy storm. Um, and again, thanks Evelyn for that, that image. The idea here is that um, Apple effectively broke mobile ad measurement as we knew it in April, 2021, when iOS 14.5 uh, came out. Now, broke is a bit of an extreme term here. Obviously mobile measurement continues, lots of tools, lots of ways Lot, lots of uh, workarounds have been made to it and a lot of other um, cool things still to do with measurement. But uh, app tracking transparency in iOS 14 changed things. It it uh, made the opt-in, mo most of you probably know, but for the few, for, the, for those of you who don't, it, it required an opt-in for apps to share data with third parties. Um, and that limited tracking, it li limited targeting. And the opt-in rates are, are relatively low, but, uh, a little under 40% for hyper-casual gaming, according to Adjust and TikTok. Um, and that's the highest rated app category. So um, when you're talking about an ad network uh, like that uh, Snap has or Meta or Google or any of these app networks, they also need an opt-in um, so that that double opt-in reduces that rate even more. Um, you're really getting a relatively small percentage of your possible audience that you can track across apps. Um, that's had a big effect on a lot of these companies. Um, in March, uh, Meta reported numbers that sit and, and mentioned that the uh, introduction of ATT, App Tracking Transparency, may have a $10 billion loss in ad revenue for them in 2022. Um, we baked that into our March forecast. Um, numbers have continued to go down throughout the year. Um, and our October forecast actually shows Meta um, having a dip in ad revenue, not just a slowdown in growth. Um, now, part of this obviously has to do with the economic situation. Um, they've had a lot, a lot of problems from that as well. But a big chunk, and at least probably ten billion billion dollars or more of that revenue, has been lost due to AT and T, ATT, and that also um, applies to Snap and to Google, especially with YouTube, um, and some of the problems they've had there as well. Um, Apple has its own solution um, based on aggregated data. Um, they just came out with their newest version, SK Ad Network 4.0. Um, and we expect that to help advertisers uh, resolve some of these issues. And in fact, more of them are starting to uh, opt into, or not opt into, adopt SK Ad Network, uh, a jump from 37% in uh, for publishers in Q2 2021 to almost uh, to over 60% in Q2 2022. Now, Evelyn, I know you you know this area a lot better than I do. So um, do you, would you mind telling us exactly how SK Ad Network, uh, in very simple terms, uh, improves over previous editions of SK Ad Network? Sure. Um, SK Ad Network 4.0 is an improvement in several ways. And I'll just, I'll give one example just so we can avoid going down a long and very technical rabbit hole here. Um, so previous versions of SKAD network only allowed conversion values to be transmitted if and when a campaign generated enough app installs. So if the campaign did not generate enough app installs to meet the so-called privacy threshold as defined by Apple, no conversion values were transmitted. So advertisers either got conversion values or they didn't. And with SCAD Network 4.0, there's a little bit more of, of a spectrum. So if a campaign only generates a few installs, reporting still won't include any conversion values. And if a campaign generates a lot of installs, reporting will include what's called fine-grained conversion values. So that's the most granular conversion data. But there's also a middle ground where reporting will include what's called coarse-grained conversion values. So the, the data is less granular, but it's it's better than nothing. Um, and that's just that's just one update that has the potential to provide a lot of additional utility to advertisers. And like I said, um, there were several updates, none of which restore full pre-ATT capabilities. But uh, if an advertiser sets everything up thoroughly and or and thoughtfully, 
And if a campaign produces enough installs, there will be more data to work with, which when leveraged correctly can lead to better informed decision making, hence increased adoption that we predict to see in the next year. Yeah, I mean, that's really well said. And I mean, the thing about SK Ad Network um, 2.0, I think that's the one that came out that was around when um, iOS 14.5 came out. It, it just, it was really uh, gave very limited information, very few events, you know, you couldn't track too many, too many different events as they happen, uh, stages in, in the app. So um, it sounds like it's, a, it's a pretty significant improvement um, with SK Ad Network 4.0. Um, at the same time, though, we are talking about the eye of a hurricane. So there's more turmoil coming and that turmoil is going to be, um, Google ad ID probably being deprecated by Google at some point in 2024. Um, and also likely other privacy laws and regulations um, in the US, but even more likely in places like um, Europe um, and Asia. Um, so there's just more uh, obstacles being thrown out there. I'm sure the measurement in industry is going to figure out ways around them as well. Uh, but um, I think right now we're sort of in that moment between two, two big uh, turmoils. So our predictions based on this trend is um, with uh, Google ad IDs no longer in play, advertisers will spend more on iOS. And this is actually a reversion to long-term trends in ad mobile advertising. iOS always had higher rates, um, attracted more dollars in the US. Um, that changed a little bit with uh, the advent of uh, app tracking transparency. It's starting to change again and move back to more even now with some of these solutions that Apple has offered. And um, as uh, Google Ad ID uh, comes close, the deprecation come clo comes closer, um, it may revert to the point where iOS uh, prices are higher and, and attracting more dollars. Um, second trend is, uh, or second prediction is that despite additional time, mobile advertisers still won't be prepared prepared for the effective eradication of mobile ad IDs. Um, and it's human nature that we procrastinate. I think a lot of companies um, are procrastinating when it comes to some of the these um, changes that are coming down the line. Um, the companies that are proactive are going to do well and have done well to this point and will continue to do well. Um, but a lot of the industry is not like that. And lastly, um, the current economic, macroeconomic conditions will actually supercharge a lot of these measurement innovations. And the reason is, as economic situations uh, could go downhill or not, we don't know how things are going. Actually, the current macroeconomic numbers are looking a little better than we thought. But if they go downhill, uh, advertisers will demand more accountability. And a way to prove the accountability of advertising is through measurement. So there's going to be a lot of innovation there as well. So let's go to the third trend. Um, and that's did matter will accelerate the smartphone's role as remote control. So matter, what is matter? It's it's kind of, um, well, it's not kind of, it's it's a language, it's an inter interoperability protocol that lets smart home devices talk to each other. It creates this unified system and instead of having systems siloed around Google Home or Alexa or Apple Home, uh, it, it it creates a unified system. And, and those are just three, there are many more uh, smart home uh, protocols out there. Creating a single protocol will create a much more unified smart home. Uh, it's soft launched in October. It had its big launch event in early November, and already 200 uh, companies have joined into the protocol. So there's a, there's a real um, move towards it. Um, and over, uh, actually over 280 companies are part of that, um, and over 200 devices or to use uh, Matter or have it built in. Um, that they, you can switch on to it. So uh, they're at launch, there are a lot of uh, uh, devices with that capability already. And the opportunity is this creates really a more useful and seamless way of integrating your smart home. Uh, and will hopefully tie in the, the virtual, a common virtual assistant to, you, to integrate everything, kind of tie everything together so that a smart home works as a really a symphony instead of these discordant different protocols all around. Um, almost half of US households use smart home devices uh, or will by 2026. About 66 million households in the US. Um, now, 
the growth rate, though, if you take a look at the the, the red line, is is pretty low. It's almost plateaued. So most of the new devices, and there are tens of millions of new devices sold each year, are being sold um, to existing house, mostly to existing households. The hope is the matter will supercharge this. That how that smart homes uh, that already have smart devices will. Uh, increase the number of devices and use them more intensively, and it will attract uh, people who have been hesitant about using the smart home. Um, so that's uh, that's really the expectation and hope with Matter. As the interoperability improves, companies will develop master remotes. Um, so there are three obvious areas where you could control your smart home. One is a smart speaker, which is, I think, a uh, uh, was Amazon's original vision, original vision for the Echo, part of the reason that it subsidizes it as much as it did for years. Um, it Through voice and through voice assistance, you can control your whole house. Um, it's kind of developed into more smart screens now. So there's Amazon Echo Show, but there's also the Nest Hub from Google. Um, Apple's going to route uh, the route of a tablet dock for the iPad. Um, portal from Meta, um, same idea, although that's kind of shifting to a B2B um, business model. Uh, but I think kind of the most obvious uh, master remote is going to be the, the an app within your phone. Um, they already exist. Apple has, you know, Apple Home. It's, it you have it at every part, you, you have it at all times, even in your home. So it makes a lot of sense that that's going to become the primary master remote, even though they may still integrate with these other remotes um, that are around the house, various different interfaces you can use. So what are, what are we expecting? We expect a new master remote in 2023. So one of these is going to uh, develop. Either uh, a new app is really going to integrate and provide new functionality, um, or some, some killer device will come out and um, take advantage of matter. And to be honest, matter, it's still an open question whether matter will take off. It could be the Esperanto of devices. We just don't know if it's going to be one of those languages that doesn't get huge uptake, but the initial signs are that it does. So I think, I think we're, we're pretty confident that a master remote will appear. Fourth trend that we're, that we're looking at are um, low earth orbit satellite networks and how they're going to become a bigger part of remote mobile service. Um, I'm an astronomy buff. Uh, I was in the desert in Nevada uh, this past summer, and I looked up and I saw um, a satellite train, so the four or five linked stars moving at a, obviously not stars, but satellites, but they look like stars, moving at a constant rate through the sky and e equidistant from each other. It was the coolest thing. And it's really these low Earth orbit satellites that are going to provide um, new types of connectivity for us down on Earth. Um, as, as a reminder, as all of you know, smart homes are the way, the primary way for connecting to the internet. Internet, when you look at the world, um, uh, over half the population uh, of the world uses, it connects to the internet using a mobile phone. And when you look at the, the other half, they either don't have connections to the internet or they're connecting through feature phones um, and just connecting with each other so for the most part. Um, it's an incredibly vital part, but many parts of the world are remote or have slow 3G or 4G service and very spotty service. Even in the US, you have areas in national parks and remote areas and rural areas that don't have great service. And you occasionally get spotty service even in cities where you have good service in general. Um, so there's definitely a need to provide provide a, a broader coverage area. Um, you're seeing companies like uh, SpaceX, Starlink, um, building out the networks. You have others, Iridium, Sat Satellio, Link. Um, they're already working on mobile networks as well. Um, but there have been a bunch of major uh, partnerships that have come out and really notable ones. Um, uh, probably... Well, I'll start with the Global Star one because that one just uh, launched Global Star and and Apple uh, just uh, in the iOS 14. Uh, you now have an ability to send SOS texts in remote areas. It's kind of the, really the first 
a use case for an ordinary smartphone, not a satellite phone, but an ordinary smartphone to connect where there's no cell phone reception. It's actually a really important, probably a life-saving innovation for some people who are hikers or who are stuck um, in a remote area and, are, uh, and can't get help otherwise. Um, but I think what, what's more interesting or not more interesting, but as interesting are, are, is, are, is the agreement and the landmark deal uh, in August from T-Mobile and SpaceX and Starlink, uh, Space, SpaceX and Star, own Starlink, um, that announced um, plans for a satellite cell service uh, down the line. Now, team, SpaceX still needs to build the, the, the satellites with the proper antennas to really get to the point where they can provide direct satellite to phone uh, full service and high-speed internet. Um, but it's coming, and it's, it's coming. It, it, both companies have announced an intent to do that, and that's going to uh, likely provide service and like really good service in a lot of new areas. Um, AT and T has also announced a partnership with AST Mo Space Mobile. Uh, that company has also partnered with Vodafone and Rakuten. Um, so there are other companies as well that are looking into that, and there are uh, all types of startups working, uh, including Chimera, um, working on uh, establishing broadband satellite broadband satellite connectivity uh, to uh, either to, for backhaul to, you know, to linking down to cell towers or directly to cell phones. In fact, $600 million just this year, even in a tightened economic environment, went, in, went to, uh, were invested in 29 satellite communications companies. So um, still a fair amount of investment going on in that area. Um, our predictions are that network providers will battle it out. Um, the these satellites, there are a lot of networks going up. Um, these are expensive. Uh, there'll probably be some winners and some losers. And that's really, I think we, we're going to see um, a lot of these networks um, really build out this year um, and, and uh, test what works and what doesn't. And we expect a few winners, as I mentioned a second ago. Starlink um, looks pretty well positioned. Uh, a few others are pretty well positioned as well. Um, but we still have to see how all those launches come together and how the, the actual connectivity to cell phones um, works. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's actually something I've been curious when it would happen. And it, it's pretty exciting that I think in 2023, it's actually going to start happening. Um, lastly, um, is Apple's aggressive push into advertising will continue. Apple um, benefits from uh, its own privacy rules. Uh, Apple's ads jumped 40.1% in 2021 when ATT came into effect. That was up from a 27.5% increase the year before. Um, and it, even this year, in 2022, it almost had 40% growth again. Apple is expanding its advertising business uh, rapidly, and um, it's really benefiting from AT&T. Um, Evelyn, I, again, this is an area that I know you study pretty closely. How has AT&T helped Apple? So AT&T, well, it's helped, helped Apple in several ways. Um, and the biggest one is really that it's, it's Apple um, search ads are kind of like an oasis where where attribution has is functioning like it always has, right? Um, and if we look forward into how Apple can can build a bigger influence in the mobile advertising ecosystem, uh, one of the the rumors that is really interesting to watch in this space is the potential for an Apple DSP. Um, and unfortunately, I don't really have any intel when it comes to the functionality or features of this potential DSP that's been reported in, in the trades for a couple of months now. Um, but Apple has an immense amount of privilege in the iOS ecosystem, not just because it owns the only app store that's currently available on iOS devices, but also because um, because of its role as a device manufacturer and because of the way that first party data has been defined. So while ATT has been <laughs> busy materially reducing the amount of consumer data that uh, mobile advertisers have had access to for targeting and measurement elsewhere, Apple um, has, has built quite the walled garden and is still sitting pretty when it comes to consumer data. And if it were to use 
that data to power its DSP. And if it were to expand its inventory footprint by, um, let's say, launching a general search engine to replace Google as the default on iOS devices and on Safari, um, it, it would become a massive gravitational force in the ad tech market. And it's all mostly owed to the changes in the ecosystem wrought by ATT. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it 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 has really supercharged their search um, functionality on the App Store, and they're they're even adding to it now. They're adding um, new uh, types of uh, advertising within their their um, in the search store. Uh, they they're giving you. Uh, they've always uh, had a you might also like section. Now they're having promoted posts there on the homepage of the App Store. Their their ads. You mentioned DSP. Um, they have ha always had ads in Apple Media and Apple News. Those are expanding, so they're really doubling down on on ads. Um, I'm gonna. I'm running a little late, so I'm just gonna whip through this last couple slides. The iOS 16. Um, also, uh, Apple announced just recently that um, standard their their 30 percent commission fee is now going to apply to social boosts, virtual way that social media companies can promote. Uh, ask uh, users can bounce up where their uh, posts appear on, in the feed in a social media company, Apple's now charging the 30% fee on that too. And that's just going to help them earn more money in their mobile app store, which is already earning $43.7 billion this year in H1. So huge business for them there as well. Um, so our predictions are Apple will face some blowback from this. They've made their name on privacy. They've evaded a lot of the scrutiny that other companies have had on it in antitrust. Um, but their app store policies, as well as their double, their, their use of some of this data in their app store, I think is going to invite more suits and regulations and scrutiny from Congress and from regulators in Europe and elsewhere. So we expect some of that in 2023. We do expect the Apple DSP to launch. Um, and we expect Apple the brands to pay more attention to Apple ads. It's a bigger platform and it's moving into areas like media where brand advertising um, makes more sense than it would in, 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 a, in the app store. So we see that growing. Um, very quickly to wrap up, um, the five trends we talked about, mobile AR advertising will grow in 2023, and we expect to see mobile anchored advertising to grow as well. SK Ad Network um, will help mobile measurement get back on its feet, um, especially SK Ad Network 4.0. Matter will accelerate to smartphones role as, as a universal remote, um, assuming Matter gets adoption, which we think it will. Satellites will help connect people in remote areas. Um, pretty exciting. It's already happening and it will happen a lot more next year. And Apple's push into advertising won't slow down. Um, and with that, Evelyn, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you, Yori. That was great. Um, and before we get to audience questions live, and we've had some, some good ones come in so far, so keep them coming. Um, I would love to bring back our special guest from T-Mobile's Advertising Solutions, Jess Zhu, Head of Advertising Products and Development. Welcome again, Jess. Hi there. Thanks again. Very excited. We are so pumped to have you here. Uh, let's start off with a question that, that could potentially lead to some healthy debate. We'll see. Um, do you agree that QR codes can help rejuvenate uh, digital out-of-home advertising after the pandemic-driven slump. Yeah, absolutely. I think that QR codes are they're really unique because they sort of unlock the ability to collapse the journey from upper funnel to lower funnel, which is really interesting because it, it actually provides an engaging touch point that drives users into an actionable touch point on their mobile devices, which they pretty much always have with them. <laughs> so as an example, we've seen a lot of success in our rideshare advertising offering, which is where we have tablets on the back of Ubers and Lyfts. Um, and you have these like captive audience that are very, very lucrative and interesting to marketers because Uber and Lyft riders tend to be 80% or 18 to 49. Um, their average household income is 130K. And suddenly you're able to capture their attention um, in an upper funnel manner through this digital out of home space. But then you're then immediately able to drive them towards um, sort of ride share or like mobile commerce via these QR codes. Um, and QR codes, we found that also they work best in these types of captive environments um, because uh, they have the dwell time, they get the message from the brand, and then they know exactly what to do afterwards. So riders already have their personal phone with them. So when the brands provide a compelling offer, um, they're really quick and eager to scan, actually. Um, 
We've even seen in cases where we've partnered to offer branded QR codes. So those are the codes that have like brand logos or more official looking and more um, integrated. Uh, they actually provide that sort of credibility in the consumer's mind so that um, they're even more willing to scan and excited to scan. Um, so these new age or like these new era of QR codes really provide our brand partners um, with some real time analytics in addition to driving them towards something, an actionable landing page or app. Um, they build to quickly a b test their strategies and capture um, and most of all capture the ios user base actually that you have a hard time addressing um and the rest of the programmatic and like ecosystems digitally awesome all right uh given t-mobile's partnership with starlink which you already mentioned um earlier in the presentation i'm sure you're no stranger to low earth orbit networks how will improved and consistent coverage across all parts of the United States um, help both consumers, obviously, and maybe a little bit more, uh, not obviously, help advertisers? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're very excited about that partnership. I think um, you already mentioned it's starting off with mostly text-based um, signal connections in those pockets that are not um, very easily covered or have consistent connections. Um, but we're looking to expand that to both voice and data, which is super exciting. And once you have voice and data, data in particular, it's going to usher in a, a, a lot of potential where you have massive coverage. You don't you have all those pockets that you can address suddenly, even within cities outside of just the rural and like people are national parks or whatever, um, which is great for consumers. And of course, advertisers can suddenly provide um, engaging content and messaging throughout the user's journey as they travel around and like um, are on the go, essentially, because users are very much um, still on the go. <laughs> uh, that doesn't surprise me. I myself am on the go frequently. <laughs> um, all right. As an ad tech provider, what kinds of questions are marketers and, and specifically mobile marketers asking you and your team as we head into the new year? Yeah. Um, so as you can probably imagine, marketers are very concerned about the impending signal loss or addressability and attribution considerations relating to that. Um, but most of them tend to be asking questions like, well, what do you have for the alternative um, identifier to replace what we have today? Um, and we think that's probably not the best question to be asking right now, just because given the regulatory um, winds and direction and the heavy emphasis and all the policy changes that are coming down, we think that signal loss is, is inevitable. It's a matter of um, when, not if at this point. Uh, and we think that that marketers would be better served actually to think about um, how to better educate themselves and start exploring and testing um, more cohort-based or panel-based capabilities, um, just because this is a good time when during this period where you have the opportunity to test and you have one-to-one -one signals available to you, you can start benchmarking and checking out these new options in the new future. How are they going to compare? How can you uh, modify and refine those models while you have the opportunity to, to really um, measure its true effectiveness. Um, and what I mean by that is like, there's a lot of probabilistic predictive models that can be very powerful and scalable using anonymized data points that you're not gonna lose access to. Um, and with a large enough, comprehensive enough panel, um, you can actually achieve comparable performance when it comes down to it as some of the deterministic one-to-one -one targeting capabilities today. Because if if we're honest, when the one-to-one -one targeting, it's there's a lot of IDs out there and it's not clear that um, we're even using it as efficiently as we could be today. Um, so I think there's, there's opportunities there as well. And the key here is really to to have a panel that's that's large enough and representative enough with the rich amount of data points um, in the panel to power the type of modeling and the, the nuances to allow you to, to target and also um, have the machine learning capabilities and processes to optimize towards the attributes that drive performance and move the needle for you. Um, so I think that's that's really interesting. And in 2020, 2023 is a really good time for marketers to start testing that. Absolutely. Yeah, marketers have, have a lot <laughs> to kind of sort through uh, in this moment. What kinds of things aren't you being asked that you think you know, more advertisers should be thinking about given the um, interesting circumstances we find ourselves in today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, marketers 
uh, should really consider is whether they're always measuring or looking at what truly moves the needle. I think that in some ways we've learned recently is looking through all the data that we have as a carrier and all the cross app data and engagement. Um, we find that actually almost across all app verticals, 80 to 90% of consumers stop engaging with an app within seven days of installing an app, um, which is super interesting because any of you guys are familiar, um, right now marketers are often driving towards an install metric or something at the bottom of the funnel. And you spend a lot of money driving towards that, but it turns out 80 to 90% of those consumers, they leave afterwards. And that, that seems like a huge lost opportunity. Um, so we think that install perhaps is a, it's a good heuristic now, but it might not be a, the best indicator of true consumer lifetime value and ROI um, as it hits the marketer's bottom line uh, in the long run. Um, so we think there's opportunity, of course, for marketers to look at incrementality and how to drive for engagement, um, consumer retention that have longer, more sustainable impacts to their bottom line and lifetime value. Um, and so this is actually a good time where we think marketers should be testing uh, cohort-based incrementality capabilities with testing control groups to see what's actually getting people to um, to to keep using their apps <laughs> in their experiences. And another big part of that is sort of the reverse funnel, which I don't think people talk enough about, is how do you uh, continue messaging and reminding users that, hey, you already have my app, remember me, I have other offers for you. So it's kind of that re-engagement model um, that I think there's a lot of room for optimization there to drive performance. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jess. Uh, now it's time to get into our audience Q&A, and we've received a lot of great questions, so we will dive right in here. Uh, Yuri, if the economy takes a turn for the worst, what which of the trends that you've talked through today do you think will, will change the most? Yeah, I mean, it is a hypothetical because we just don't know which direction the, the economy is going, but let's posit that it is will get worse. Um, I think satellites are uh, relatively recession uh, proof since they're, there's the money's more long term. I don't see that being affected too much. Same thing with Apple uh, as measurement as well. Um, if anything, measurement will accelerate. Measure, me measurement innovations will accelerate if uh, as people want more accountability. I think the one that could be affected is uh, mobile is anchored AR. I think that's something which is a cool technology that's developing. It's 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 ripening, I guess is a good, weird way to put it, but it, it's gotten to the point where it's um, uh, has some really cool applications. If people are cutting back though, that might be um, one area that gets delayed or paused um, a little bit more than some of the others. I don't expect that to happen, but um, I'd say that's probably the first one. I, the one that's probably the, the most recession endangered of those, these five. Uh Interesting. So let's maybe flip that that on its head. What are some big opportunities that might yeah. arise uh, for ad tech during an economic downturn? I, I mean, there, there there are actually a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of opportunities. One is, um, first of all, what I mentioned provides sort of account you know tools to, to show accountability. Um, that's what businesses need now. Um, second of all. When there are tech layoffs, there's a lot of tech talent out there. Um, I think it's a moment to hire people if you're in a position to do so. Lots of great talent out there in a, a in a broader atmosphere when there's been a, a dearth of people um, uh, with you know the the tech skills that a lot of companies need it. So um, this might be a, a moment to hire if you can do that. Um, and it definitely uh, for the companies that are looking for. Um, Accountability can show the results. Um, it's also an opportunity as well. Awesome, Jess. Do you do you care to chime in? Do you see any big opportunities uh, if if a, an economic downturn continues to go the way things have been going? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all hopeful that there won't be um, a, a more dramatic downturn. Um, but if it were to happen, I think in addition to what Yori has mentioned, um, the big one that we're sort of watching for is uh, additional M&A within the ad tech and MarTech spaces. I think just as there's a lot of layoffs, there's also a potential for companies to to want to sell a lot of their, their know-how, their tech, um, and bigger ones might be interested in uh, just consolidating and building out their stack as a result. Um, 
I think there's a lot of cool opportunities that we could see there looking and everyone's paying attention. Um, so excited to see what innovations that are going to happen as a result out of this. Absolutely. Um, there's always opportunity that arises out of times of, of uh, acute challenge as well. So looking forward to seeing what happens. Um, this is an interesting one. What is the status of the Android privacy sandbox? So we talked about the deprecation of Google ad IDs uh, already today. Um, and Yuri, if you don't mind, maybe I'll, I'll jump in myself um, and just mention that a few weeks ago, uh, it was announced that the Android Privacy Sandbox will be rolling out in beta next year, um, which is really one of the first kind of more concrete um, steps along the timeline that we've we've been given as an industry. Um, we had that kind of final end of 2024, a little bit more vague deadline for when Google Ad IDs will actually be deprecated. Um, and this beta announcement is, is the new thing. We don't have a ton of information about what proposals within the Android Privacy Sandbox, um, you know, how, how they're going to perform because testing hasn't really started in earnest yet and there isn't really scale there um, for those tests to um, have a ton of real actionable meaning. Um, but we do have a little bit of information about how Privacy Sandbox initiatives are going on the Chrome side of things. Um, so if you're curious about the way that certain solutions are going, I encourage you to, to look at some of those reports and see what um, some initial findings are for things like Topics and Fledge. Um, I do know one of the, the big kind of uh, red flags that's arising around Topics, for example, is that smaller publishers um, are finding it very difficult to, to, um, to monetize their audiences properly. They are providing so much value to the ecosystem because their niche publications um, have more specific topics assigned to them, whereas bigger publishers might be assigned something broad like news and not provide as much value back into the ecosystem for their audience members. Um, so there's just kind of an imbalance in value there. Um, does that, do either of you, Yori or Jess, have anything to, to um, contribute on the <laughs> Android privacy sandbox question mark? I'm going to leave it at that. I mean, you said it as well and actually much better than I would have said it. So I, I, I'll just leave it there. Awesome. Well, we have time for um, just one more question here and maybe we'll we'll leave off with an interesting example that can um, maybe inspire some of our audience members today. So um, Yuri or Jess, whoever um, might thinks they have a really great example here. What is one example of how a retailer or brand is successfully monetizing AR digital out of home today? Um, we saw some really cool GIFs or GIFs. Not sure how how anyone out there pronounces that. Yuri, on your slide for for AR, um, but there's got to be some really interesting advertiser um, activations that that are um, exciting in the marketplace. Yeah. Uh... I, I'm blanking right now. I know Calvin Klein had something off a of billboard in Times Square a while back. Uh, went to a product page. I don't remember if the, I mean it was a, it was a QR launched um, billboard that that took you to a product page and some experiences. I don't remember it was AR incorporated within it. Um, I, I'm it's funny. I've actually seen these, um, and I'm just blanking on the examples right now. Um, well, honestly, maybe that's a good sign. Maybe there's so much yeah. exciting stuff out there that it that it is uh, hard to pick one out as as um, the most exciting um, or a an especially wonderful example. For well, sure. um, thank you both so much, Yuri and Jess. This has been wonderful, and unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, thanks again, Yuri, for joining us, and a very special thanks to Jess and to the team at T-Mobile Advertising Solutions. Um, our eMarketer production crew behind the scenes, they also deserve a huge thank you for making this webinar possible. We quite literally could not do it without them. As promised, we will be emailing you a link to today's slides as, as well as a full recording of the session. So make sure you keep an eye out on your inbox for that. Um, and then before we wrap up, let me take a moment to just tell you what's happening across eMarketers media channels. Uh, you can register for upcoming live analyst webinars um, as well as tech talk webinars at eMarketer.com slash webinars. And also on that page, you'll have the opportunity to register for our first ever 
live virtual summit called Attention, Trends and Predictions for 2023. It's taking place tomorrow, December 9th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Yours truly will be moderating the Ask the Experts Q&A, and I encourage you to join us. Um, it's going to be packed with crucial insights. On the audio side, don't forget to tune into Behind the Numbers eMarketers Daily Podcast, which you can find anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And finally, please check out our newsletters. We have a couple of options across retail and finance and, of course, digital advertising. So there's something for everyone. And if you haven't already signed up, you can do so at emarketer.com slash newsletters. Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your workday and have a wonderful holiday season.